time this morning making those up, getting them ready for you guys. So she'd love for you to have one during service. Oh, she had helpers. It wasn't just her, yeah. Well, as they are doing that, we are in a series together, church, this summer on the book of Genesis. And we're kind of in the part of the book of Genesis where we are spending a lot of time with a guy by the name of Jacob, um, who is far from a role model, but definitely very, very interesting character to read about. So I'm going to read for us our scripture for this morning. It comes out of Genesis 28. I encourage you to turn there in your Bible and maybe uh, put a bookmark there so you can spend time there this week. Reading Genesis 28, verses 10 through 19. Uh, the first half of 19, reading the NIV, the word of the Lord this morning. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. I give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, which means the house of God. The word of the Lord for us this morning, thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, thank you that you give us scriptures such as this to teach us. Thank you that you give us the privilege of worshiping together as a family. Be with us as we hear your truth preached this morning. Guide my words to reflect your truth. By the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to every heart gathered here, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. Amen. I remember where I was when I first heard the news was sitting on my couch at my apartment back in Monroe, and a message came across my phone from one of my college roommates in a group chat that we use from time to time, but not often that the three of us share. He had texted me to let me know that the Taco Bell on the corner of Stratford and Maine was getting an update. So it was no longer gonna have those rickety chairs that swivel and the really kind of outdated decor and way too many fake house plants hanging from the ceiling. No, it was gonna be one of those modern fast food places that looks like someone whose middle name is Boring designed it and just has no charm at all. It was getting turned into a normal old everyday Taco Bell. And he messaged us because he knew we would be upset about this. That wasn't just a Taco Bell, that was the Taco Bell of our college years. We drove past it on the way back to our apartment, which is a little bit problematic if you're, you know, studying late at night and you have no impulse control and you're 22 years old. So we ate at that Taco Bell a lot. We spent a lot of time there. We pretty much knew all the songs on the playlist there. And now it's going to just be a normal old everyday Taco Bell, like any Taco Bell. For me and my friends, as weird as that is, that Taco Bell was a place that mattered to us. So I have a question for you, and this isn't just for the big people. This is for all the kids in the room, too. And this is not a rhetorical question, so you can shout it out. Where is your favorite place? Where is your favorite place? There we go. Kurt, why is that your favorite place? Why is that your favorite place? Makes me feel at peace. Yeah, good, good. Anyone else? Favorite place? Anyone willing to share? Costco. If you don't know, that's my wife, our children's pastor, who said that. That's <laughs> we bump into her there sometimes, Jeremy. We bump into her at Costco. Why is, I don't even need to ask her why Costco's her favorite place. I know. <laughs> Someone over here. What was that? 
concert venue. There we go. Yeah, probably lots of great memories there. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Awesome. Any kids have a favorite place? Yeah, Micah. Really peaceful there. Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, I think as silly as my story I started with was, I think you guys kind of get what I'm putting down here. There's places that matter to us in our lives. Some of them we only go to once. It's a place you'll only see again in pictures. I mean, I think of like our wedding venues, not in Michigan. It's back in Indiana and probably will never be there again. But that was the place we became husband and wife, Bree and I. That's a place that contains memories that matters to us. When we drive past there, we go, oh, you know, that's where we got married. You have places like this in your minds. Right? All of us do, young and old. There's places that matter to us. It might even be just the place you sit in this room. Humans like places. It's one of, one of the things that you'll find about us, about the, the human creature. If you look at, into studies of college students in a classroom where there's no assigned seats, so really similar to church, with no assigned seats, you can sit wherever you want. What you'll find is college students tend to sit almost exclusively in the same seat every single class. Now, I can testify to this. I get really frustrated if you take my unassigned assigned seat. Now, anytime, you know, there's like a stereotype that church people, you know, they've got, a, you know, they put their name on the end of the pew. And we actually did literally used to do that. But Really, us humans, we like that. We kind of naturally do this. When we go to Sunrise Diner, I really hope they seat us at the table that Bree and I sat at the first time we moved here, just for no reason. I mean, it doesn't change the food. It's just nice. It's nice to have places with memories and with feelings and emotions that we can kind of get back into. For those of us that have been training for the marathon, there's places on our running routes where we know a hill is coming, and we don't like those places. All the same, there's memories there. Like there's, there's something about it. It could be driving in your car. It could be a particular place that you had an important memory. For a lot of people in this church and on this, oh, as you heard before, on the Eastern Michigan District, a really special place is Water's Edge Camp over there on Burkhart. There are people who come to this church who received words from the Lord at that camp, people who prayed the prayer of salvation at that camp. I have a friend named Katie who worked at camp with me, and she prayed the prayer of salvation at kids' camp there, and years later, as a college student, she found the spot on the carpet she had been and got the coordinates for that and has the latitude and longitude she prayed the prayer on her ankle as a tattoo. Place matters to us. It's something that, just humans, we can't get away from it. We could try to pretend like we don't care about places, but it's, that's why it's hard to move. That's why rearranging the furniture could be so jarring. That's why we tend to sit in about the same part of this room when we come to church until, you know, you and the other people who are sharing joint custody of your seats show up on the same Sunday, and then one of you's got to move, and then you're like, ah, i got to get there early next week. We like places. They're important to us. There's, when I think of the campground or I think of where I went to school or when I think of this building, there's dozens of spots where I have memories, and where, especially where I have memories of encounters with God in a particular place, at this altar, at the altar at camp, driving up Burkhart in my rusted out 03 Cavalier, praying, listening to the radio. Places are burned into our mind. They're a part of the DNA of life. They're just part of who we are. The, the places we find ourselves in become a part of who we are. And I believe this story is a story about place. And, and part of the reason I believe that is because of a word that's in here. But if you noticed as we've gone through Genesis, God seems to care a lot about where his people are. Now, we tend to make that some sort of practical application piece, like how we're behaving or, you know, where are you at with your, like, time management or your character. But there's all this talk in the Old Testament, if you read through the Bible, of the promised land, the land of Canaan, the land, the place God wants his people to be. He's calling them to a location and to, they'll say it this way, and to a vocation, a purpose. But we tend to focus on the purpose and not the place. Abraham's called to the promised land. He leaves the land of Haran and travels some 450 miles down to the promised land. He doesn't spend a lot of time there. Then he keeps on traveling to Egypt and he gets into some trouble and he sells his wife and it's a bad time. 
Then Isaac lives in the promised land. And then Jacob is born into the promised land with his brother. And if you go back and listen to last week's sermon, they didn't quite get along. So after a while, he tricks his brother. He steals his birthright. He tricks his father, his whole family. And Jacob flees as a refugee because his brother's trying to take him out. And he goes back to Haran, the place his grandfather was from, to find a spouse from his own kind of culture and family. So this is about a 450-mile journey on foot alone Jacob is taking. Why? Well, because his, his father said, go to Haran and get a spouse for yourself there in that place. Not here, not in Canaan. So on this 450-mile trip alone, we get these really weird words. And this is um, one of my biggest pet peeves is when people give me not quite enough direction. So they say, oh, it's over there. And I'm like, where? Where over there? But this is what we get here. Jacob leaves Beersheba, sets out for Haran, when he reached a certain place. Where's that? Well, we don't know. He just, he arrived at a particular place that at this point in the story just could have, could have been anywhere. But he arrived somewhere. The NIV doesn't show us it, but in the Hebrew, that word for place, makom, is here four times. There's a story about location. So he shows up, and he, he arrives at this certain place, and he goes to sleep. And it must not be a very nice place. There's no hotel there, because he uses a rock as a pillow. And he goes to sleep at this particular place. That word for place appears in verse 11, 16, 17, and 19. So it's all throughout the story. And what was just some place becomes the place where he encounters God. So it's just some random spot on the road, some 450 miles of road. We don't know exactly where it is, but he stops at this real place, this nonspecific but real place, and there he encounters God. Now, I'm, I want to lean into this idea of, of place, of, of specific places, and kind of ask ourselves, what does this teach us about who God is and who we're called to be? Because one of the things that's true, and you even get it in this text, we talk about this a lot, is God is everywhere. God is everywhere. I know the kids at, here at Centerpoint, they know that. I know that God's all around us. They talk about the Holy Spirit a lot. Pastor Bree really uses a lot of that Holy Spirit language with them. So I know you kids get this, and us big people, I think we get it too. God's everywhere. God's everywhere. In verse 15, it says, I'm with you and will watch over you wherever you go. So God's able to be anywhere. And some would even say God is already everywhere. And I think we kind of get that. God's too big to fit in our building or in your pocket or in your car, however much space you have in your car. No amount of trunk space can contain God. He's everywhere. I think we get that. It's important. But the, as the story goes, God isn't just everywhere in a generic way. God's in certain places in a really specific way. Because God's not just everywhere. God's also over there. He's in Haran. It says in this passage, I will not leave you until I've done what I have promised. So he's like, hey, listen, I'm with you everywhere. I'm with you where you're going. I'm, I'm going to be with you when you go to this place. So God's everywhere. And God's over there where we're headed. He says this to Jacob. But Jacob's not just supposed to flee as a refugee to Haran and, and find a wife and settle down there. He is supposed to come back to the land of promise. So not only is God everywhere, not only is God over there in the future, but as he's talking to Jacob, he reminds him that he's back there in the promised land. He says, I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I promised to you. You understand, you're starting to see where God seems concerned with location. You know, that's like the three L's of real estate, isn't it? Location, location, location. The, God seems pretty concerned with where his people are. So all that stuff's maybe beautiful. God's everywhere. God's where we're headed. One of the ways I say this is the Holy Spirit's always bringing our future to us. I picked that up from one of my professors. So God's in your future already. Wherever you're going for lunch, God's already there. You're just going to go meet him. You're going to go, the Holy Spirit's already there. And God's back in where God's taking us to, right? God is in our past, our present, our future. But what's really weird is that God's also somewhere. So see if you can follow this. God's everywhere. God's over there. God's back there. But God's also somewhere specific, 
or in this case, not specific. So this passage doesn't just say God's kind of everywhere. Jacob just bumps into him all over the place. That's true. We believe that. But God shows up specifically in a certain place. Wait a minute. I thought God was too big to be kept in one place. What? I thought God was everywhere. Somehow, God is everywhere and there at the same time. So while God is really, really big, God also gets really, really close. He shows up in a way, and in a particular way, in this place that Jacob's sleeping. And when Jacob wakes up, he's blown away by this. This is where we get the song Stairway to Heaven. Some translations call it ladder. You got little Jacob's ladder toys that just go up and up and up. This is a beautiful story, but with the scandal of the story, isn't it that Jacob sees this really cool thing? It isn't, and it, it's important that he gets this promise from God. But what blows him away, he wakes up and he goes, surely the Lord is in this place. I'm convinced God is here. Jacob wakes up with those words on his lips. And I almost titled the sermon that. That was almost the name of today's sermon. But if you finish his sentence, he says, surely the Lord is in this place. And then he says, and I was not aware of it. God is not just out there. God's not just over there. God's not just back there in the promised land. God is here, and I didn't notice. I missed it. I was not aware of it. That's actually what I've titled the sermon today. And I was not aware of it. Well, why, why does this matter? I just keep throwing the word where around with other beginnings to it to confuse you guys, if you haven't noticed. I'm just trying to be as confusing as I can be. So at the end of the sermon, you go, he must have said something smart because I have no clue what he said. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. I think sometimes we spend a lot of our energy talking about how God's everywhere. We do this with church. You hear this in church language. Like, well, you know, the church is just a building. God's everywhere. And, and, and I get that. At the same time, you know, why for 2,000 years have Christians kept walking into places to worship God? If God's everywhere, why do we gather? If God's everywhere, if God's with, you know, Bill when he's over here and with Ron when he's over there, why do we need to be in the same room? Why does place matter? I think sometimes when we over, when we focus too much on the fact that God's everywhere, we miss the fact that God is, is somewhere, somewhere specific, for me, sometimes that's the, the seat of my car as I'm driving. For me, sometimes that's working out in my basement. For some of my friends, that's particular places they go to pray or, or hiking trails they go when they really need to work something out with God, they'll go hike the same trail. For many of us, because I've talked to you and I know this, for, because you've said it to me, this place is one of those somewheres that God shows up. Camp. You know, those kids, there was, I actually had the privilege of that. Three of my campers came to Jesus last week. Had nothing to do with me. I barely knew them. I don't think they knew my name till Tuesday. They prayed the prayer on, Wednesday, on Monday. So it had nothing to do with me. But they're going to remember that place. They were in a place when they prayed that prayer. It's not just generic. It is specific. They'll remember that. God's not just generically everywhere, though he is everywhere. He's also somewhere. If we're looking for him. And I think this is good news because when I tell you God's everywhere, that can create a lot of pressure to not miss him. <laughs> like, well, if, if God's everywhere and you don't feel like you're close to God, that's on you. You know, you kind of missed it. He's everywhere. But then think of our experiences, you know, the Taco Bells, the, the lakes, the, the places where we find peace and memories. And those places matter to us. I think if we're made in the image of God and we connect to places, I think maybe there's a chance that God likes to use places to connect with us. Now, it's not the place. It's not the room. It's the presence of the Lord. But can we own up to the fact that God sometimes is, shows up in specific places? It could be your kitchen table. It could be your desk, your bed, your car, this room. It could be the altar. For many of us, it was the baptismal tub at this church or some other church. Your wedding venue where you received your first communion as a married couple. It could be the tabernacle at Water's Edge where hundreds of men and women have received the calling of God on their life to enter pastoral ministry. It could be in Tampa, Florida where all of these teens got together. God shows up in places. God is present in specific 
places. And I think this is important because we're, we're, we're going somewhere. So, so keep up, try and, try and follow me. I know I'm kind of all over the place. But so, so God's everywhere and God's in our future and, and we say that. There's lots of verses that tell us that. And, and God's also somewhere. I think if we start to believe that, then this next statement is way less hard to believe. If we're convinced God's out there somewhere, if we could just go bump into him, then the phrase God is here becomes easier to put our faith in. Because God's not just generically on the move in the world, though he is everywhere. God's not just in some places you haven't made it to yet. God shows up in specific ways, in particular places. And I think, church, if we can believe that, then when you start to wonder, is God here with me, it, it may be quicker for us to arrive at a yes. Yes, I believe he is here. Yes, I believe he's in this room. Because I don't think God just could be in this room as, a, as some concept, some abstract thing. I think, he, I think he really is here. The scripture says that where two or more gather together in Jesus' name, there he is. Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Not, I'll leave you and forsake you when you're in the wrong spot. And then sometimes I'll come, I'll come get you when you come to the altar or you're sitting in the pew or you're at church or whatever. God's so beautifully specific with us. He's so personal with us. Now, I don't encounter God at your dinner table every morning where you do your devotionals and your prayers, but you can. God is somewhere, and that means that at any given moment, there's a good chance God is here. He's in the places you expect to see him. He's in the places you'd never expect to see him. And because of that, when you get done with an encounter with the Lord, you, I feel like we say the same thing Jacob does. Surely the Lord is in this place. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, wow, God's all over the place. Jacob wakes up and he's shocked that God is right where he is. And he's so Overwhelmed by this, he gives it a name. He calls it Bethel, the house of God. He says, surely this is the house of God. Now, wait a minute. We don't even know where this is. It's just some place on 450 miles of road. And he's going to go, he has the gall to call it the house of God. Well, maybe. Maybe that's the type of God we serve. Maybe that's the type of God we serve is a God who shows up when we're just kind of making our way and he just shows up. Not in some general way, but in a specific way. In certain moments, and dare I say, in certain places. Certain places. It's my prayer we wouldn't miss this. And I think in an effort to remember that God's presence is everywhere, sometimes we forget that he's like right here. And I would love for us every day to, to say the first half of the sentence, surely the Lord is in this place. I really don't want us to find ourselves saying, I was not aware of it. I don't want us to miss it. Now, hear me saying this, I don't want you to miss church, because I believe the Lord is in this place. But can I say to you, as your pastor and your friend, there are lots of places the Lord is that you need to find. There's places where you go, you know, I think the Lord might be out there already at the softball field. I'm going to go join him. And sure, he's everywhere, but I'm convinced because he's everywhere, he's over there. I know God's everywhere, but might I just become convinced he's in my kid's school. Not just everywhere, he's there. He's on the bus with them. He's at your workplace. He's at your dinner table. What if we were so in tune with the Spirit's movement that, that anywhere and everywhere we could just say, the Lord is in this place. He's here. He is here. I don't know where you need this the most. I'm, I'm fairly convinced that all of us have somewhere that we need God to show up. Now, that might be an abstract thing for you. Maybe it's in your anger or it's in your, you know, your depression, your anxiety. Maybe it's a real place. Maybe you're just like, you know, I just wish my place was just, my home was so filled with the Spirit that, 
that like the neighbors would comment on it when they come in and, and, and stop by the house. Like, I know we want God with us everywhere, but is there a place, a somewhere, you need the presence of God? Is there somewhere specific you desperately need God to just show up with a ladder to heaven and remind you he's there? What is that place for you? And you can go ahead and be specific. You do not need to make this an abstract concept. I just need God, more of God in my life. Sure, where? Where? Where in your life? Let's, let's be specific. I think God hears us. I'm pretty convinced that he answers prayers. What if, what if you like, Lord, I just need you more in my home. I just need you more in my home. Lord, I get so angry when I do the dishes. I'm angry at my kids and my spouse. I'm so frustrated. Would you just be at my kitchen sink, Jesus? And that may sound silly. I don't think it sounds silly to God to invite him in to just our everyday places. One of the things that I, I thought I was going somewhere else at the end of this, and I'm going to try to take it a different way, because as I was singing this morning, I just feel like we've got to talk about holiness today. What Jacob does when he's done, when he's arri arrived at the realization, oh my goodness, God is here and I didn't even notice, is he sets up this pillar and he anoints it with oil. Now, now when you anoint something with oil in the Bible, sometimes we think of that as God's presence. But what, what actually is happening in an anointing is we are setting something aside for God's purposes. We're giving it to God. We're saying, God, this thing or person, often it's, it's a king or somebody, this thing is yours for you to fill it. It's offering up. So when Jacob realizes God is here, he sets up this pillar as a reminder. He, the rock he slept on, he sets it up to remind him that God showed up here once. But then he anoints it with oil to say, God, this space is yours. The big $10 word we use for that as holiness people is consecration. It's a setting aside, assigning something to God. God, this is yours. God, from now on, our family's dinner table is yours. You can have it. It is your place. Do with it what you want. Now, as holiness people, people who want to, and all that means, the short version of that is, we believe we're called to live the way God calls us to live. We believe that's possible before we're in a box on the ground and raised to glory with Jesus. We believe in some way we can live out the calling of God on our lives. And part of that is when we realize, oh my goodness, God is in this place. I think God wants to be present in my marriage. I, I'm pretty sure God wants to be present at my workplace. When we, when we have this epiphany of God is here, the fitting response is to say, God, this is yours now. If you want to be here, it's yours. I'm giving it to you. This is no longer my desk in my office, it's your desk. This is no longer the cab of my work truck, it's the cab of your work truck. I'm gonna set this place aside for you to do what you want. And the beauty of that, church, is that what God wants is to show up. What did he do for Jacob? He just, just intercepts him and is like, by the way, I will never leave you wherever you go. I, I'm convinced when we give these bits of our life to the Lord, he intends to show up and fill them and bless them and promise to us that he won't leave us and to be present with us. I'm, I'm convinced that that is the God we serve. I, I believe that's what this scripture is showing us. A God who is not just some concept, a God who wants to be with you physically where you are. Church, I think that's good news. I'm convinced that's good news. Were we able to get those, those words into the slide? Oh my goodness, you guys are great. We have the best, we're the best team here. This is a, a prayer from St. Patrick. It's called St. Patrick's Breastplate. We're gonna, I'm gonna invite you to pray it with me out loud together. We don't usually do this sort of thing here. Um, but that idea that God's not just everywhere, but he's specifically in certain places, I want us to pray, to pray that. And I think St. Patrick's prayer is really, really helpful for that. So I'm gonna ask if you could put it on the screen to make sure I'm reading the right version. I'm gonna ask that you would pray this with me. We're not in a hurry. 
Let me pray this nice and slow. This is not just saying, God, be, Christ be with me. It's saying, Christ be with me, and then getting real specific. We're gonna pray this together. Would you pray with me, church? Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every person who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer. For many of us, myself included, I've spent a lot of time focusing on the fact that you're everywhere and I forget that you're right here on my left and my right and in front of me and behind me and in me. So Jesus, we ask that you would remind your church of this beautiful truth. That you want to show up, not just as, a, as an idea, but show up in the places we live, in the places we spend our time, in the places we share with other people. Jesus, we ask that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would do this in us. Help us to see, just like Jacob did, to, to get up from a meal with our family or get done with a drive in the car or a, a time fishing on the lake and say, oh my goodness, surely the Lord is in this place. Help us to notice. Heavenly Father, thank you that you give us places to meet with you. Help us to offer them back to you, trusting you to fill them, to transform them. Jesus, we are so thankful that you meet us would you be with us as we go from this place to all the places between this Sunday and next Sunday? We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen, amen. Church, if you're able to comfortably stand, I invite you to your feet as we pray a blessing over you. Don't forget on your way out, sign up uh, for what you wanna bring to the potluck. We, by definition, we cannot do a potluck without you. We need your help to do it. And I encourage you guys to participate in that way. I think there's something cool about ending service with communion and then right after that, going from the Lord's table to a table that's full of casseroles and meats and salads that we made. I think it's a beautiful thing. August 6th, you're gonna be a part of that. As we go from this place, may you receive this blessing. May you go from this place knowing that God isn't just somewhere out there. He's the somewhere that you are. He's here with you. May you know God's presence in your workplaces, your home places, and everywhere in between. When you're with your families, when you're by yourself, would you feel God's presence? And now may, the God, may God, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful. God will do this. Church, it's in that hope you're sent back into God's good world. Hug somebody, tell them you love them. Go in peace.